Today, well, we're going to, we're, we're obviously, clearly, the, the big part of the day is we're going to be talking about emergencies and what type of equipment and how to be using it in those type of emergencies. Um, but what, uh, what Tim Story was referring to is something uh, we're going to call delayed emergency. I like to bring that up because, you know, when we talk about emergencies at sea, we hear these stories, the mass came crashing down, engine failure, you know, couldn't get into a harbor. Um, but emergencies like this don't just occur out of nowhere. Um, there's usually all these things that lead up to the emergency, these chain of events, you know, things that happen. It could start from poor watch keeping, um, poor navigating, putting yourself in situations where you shouldn't necessarily be in, but boats just don't sink, boats just don't capsize, boats just don't catch on fire. There's always something re coming up to these emergencies. And today we're going to be really focusing on delayed emergencies, identifying them, knowing how to mitigate them, and using the equipment to mitigate these type of delayed emergencies. The other types of emergencies that uh, Rick and Ladd were referring to were these immediate onset emergencies. Um, the mass came down, you know, something that you have to do about it, you're immediately reacting to. With Rick's story, you said there were 10, 10 crew members or so? You know, ten, immediately 10 crew members began to do something and, and uh, Perhaps you had a plan, or at least you've talked about this before. You know, what what are we going to do if the mass falls down? Um, this forward, forward, forward thinking. So we got three different tables here right now. We'll call this group one, group two, group three. Uh, it's a quick exercise I want to run through. I'm going to give each uh, each table a set of cards. Um, each card has a word on it. Um, what I would like you to do, <laughs> working as a group, is if there was an emergency, and I'll give you a specific one, your boat sank and you're getting into your life raft, um, these steps on these cards, I'd like you to prioritize them as it relates to that specific emergency. Hi, Kathy. How are you? I uh, know, I know. Right around 8 a.m. <laughs> now, what the seven steps of survival are is um, the Coast Guard did approximately a 10 year study with uh, shipwreck survivors during the 80s. They spoke with a lot of these survivors, and, and through their experiences, they came up with a priority list of certain steps that you can take uh, in a certain emergency. And before you jump on my back, let me explain. Let me explain a little bit what we're talking about for these. Um, and that's not that any of your your um, definitions were wrong, but I'll explain it a little bit more. So number one, recognition. Um, and a lot of you guys hit on every everybody's answer for recognition as where you explained in this is would be my same definition. And that's recognizing there's a problem. You smell something funny. The boat doesn't feel right. Um, we talked about that forward thinking on the watch captain speaking with each other, doing a, a walk around the boat looking for shackles, identifying those delayed emergencies, or identifying. Hey, I'm in an emergency. Because you know, you hear these sea stories about how it happens so quick. It happens so quick. Recognize there's a problem and start acting and doing something about it. Number two, inventory. Um, and Group One gave a great definition for this. Uh, although they had it. Uh, oh yeah, they had it. I'm looking. Um, yeah, I'm looking the other way. They had a great definition for this, and that's just you know, what's my situation? What can help me? What can hurt me? What's going on? Where's my crew? Uh, but when you really boil it down, you know, recognition, hey, there's a problem. What am I going to do about it? What can help? What can hurt? Number three, shelter. Why would we have number three, shelter? Uh, and I gave you a specific situation. You're abandoning ship into a life raft. So, all right, you're thinking, well, life raft is our shelter. Boat sank. You know, that's going to be our primary shelter. But when it boils down to it, think a little differently now. What? You're at sea. What is your primary shelter? What's your first? Uh, I, that's the answer I wanted to get out. But your primary shelter is your clothing. 
We had a gentleman uh, who was a sales manager from Gill do this class last year, and he was ecstatic when he heard, heard about this. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, your foul weather gear is a major uh, role in your safety equipment. But he changed his whole sale pitch from there. <laughs> For those of you who are wearing what you're wearing right now, and you were sailing this morning in that rainstorm, how would you be feeling right now? miserable uh, in a bad situation. We're not going to get into great detail about you know, the dress for success, but your primary, uh, your primary shel shelter is the clothing you're wearing, then your boat. Um, you know, we're get, we'll, we'll do life rafts more later today. You know, we'll talk about always stepping up into the life raft. You always want to be with the boat as long as possible. But your primary cl uh, sh uh, shelter is your clothing. And if you're not ready, if you're not dressed uh, in the right stuff, you're going to be having a miserable time. You're putting yourself in danger, and you're putting your crew in danger. Um, Guarantee in the pool this afternoon, one person will be very cold, even with all their gear on. And that would very, very probably cold. be skinny lad. Yeah. Maybe Jean, maybe Casey, too. <laughs> uh, number four, signals. <laughs> you recognize there's a problem. What can help me? What can hurt me? Am I ready to approach the situation? And signals, um, Brad, Brad put it out really well, is you know, get out as much, use every tool in the toolbox, everything you have, that, that, that EPIRB, that Mayday call, that Iridium cell phone, your single sideband, your VHF, you're putting out as many signals as you have. Because whatever emergency you find yourself in, um, whether it's a meteor comes crashing through this building or you have to abandon ship into your life raft. Better yet, the building gets struck by lightning. The building gets struck by lightning and we're on fire. <laughs> You know, you're not going to help your situation unless you can bring help to yourself. You know, you'll be in that life raft for days and days and days without proper signals. And then finally, water, food, play. Um, uh, food and seven, play. Uh, you know, the rule of, you know, generally speaking, the rule of three is you can go three minutes without breathing. You can go three minutes, uh, three days without water, three weeks without food. Um, food's really not that important. That's why it's so low on the list. It may help your positive state of mind, but you know, water is going to be a really important, important thing. And, and that goes for just being on the boat sailing. You don't have to be in an emergency, but you know, keeping the body well hydrated um, is going to contribute to your safety. Also, um, <laughs> you know, offshore racing is an endurance event. Um, you know, you don't gr you don't jump on your bike and ride 100 miles without. Uh, you know, drinking water. You don't sail 600 miles to Bermuda, you know, dehydrated. Um, so, you know, the rule of threes, uh, three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food, and three months without companionship. Love. Companionship. Um, if you remember during, what was the movie with Tom Hanks? Uh, Castaway. 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 What happened at the three-month mark in Castaway for Tom Hanks? He became friends with Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yeah. Wilson was introduced, his companionship. Uh, and lastly, play, and you guys all had that right. Um, positive. By the way, play does include Scrabble. Yeah. We have plenty of people who put a deck of cards in their life raft. <laughs> uh, positive, positive state of, just a positive state of mind. In any emergency, whether uh, it's at sea or, or, you know, you take, for example, 9-11. Uh, um, only 12 to 25 percent of the people in an emergency can stay calm, cool, and collective. So if, if, this, if, if group number two was all in a life raft with just three people, 12 to 25 percent of them are going to be able to remain calm, cool, and collective. And it's probably not going to be dad because he just lost his boat. Um, <laughs> you know, so now you're going to be relying on somebody like Casey to kind of bring that group together. And when you're speaking about specific times in a life raft, um, that could be giving someone a game of Scrabble to play, somebody a pump to keep pumping up the life raft. It's just that positive state of mind or that will, the will to live. Um, and these are the seven steps of survival. We're going to be applying these to all of our activities today as we identified these delayed and um, emergency, uh, delayed and immediate immediate emergencies. Yeah. When we say the 12 to 25 percent are able to remain calm, cool, collective, that other 75 percent now are showing signs of uh, you panic, um, hyperactivity, depression, uh, solitude. Um, they'll blame themselves for this, this scenario. <laughs> the biggest thing I've seen is the things that they're able to do before the emergency all of a sudden is blank. That they right. just they can't figure out how to turn the e on all of a sudden. But the more you so practice and the more you, you talk about these types of emergencies, the better you're going to be able to react uh, for them. I mean, for those who are training uh, for, for, for racing right now, um, 
you know, these are things you're going over with your crew, you're practicing with, you're, you're developing these scenarios. Um, you know, as a family who's cruising, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, you don't just jump on the boat and go. You're planning for these things will help mitigate that to have more people in the 12 to 25 percent. Um, I have an article I'll provide you, uh, I'll print out later, that was done by the uh, uh, British Royal Navy in the 50s that, uh, where this specific study came out of. Um, and one of the things they found in that study, this is the age before EPIRBs um, and all these great signaling devices that uh, close to 75 percent of the people after a shipwreck, they end up in the lifeboats, um, were found uh, perished within three days of the accident. Well, it takes longer than three days to die without water, so why were these people dying? And that's because they didn't have the will to live.